Hello, it's Scott Manley here. 36,000 kilometres above the Earth in geostationary orbit, a 20-year-old communications satellite is being carefully approached by another spacecraft launched on a Russian Proton rocket last year. No, this isn't some nefarious surveillance plan. The spacecraft is the Mission Extension Vehicle and it is going to visit Intelsat 901 and give it a new lease of life. Servicing and repair of spacecraft on orbit has been something that's been talked about since the 1960s, but it hasn't happened very often. The, the main examples are the Hubble Space Telescope and Intelsat 603, both of which needed a space shuttle and a crew of trained astronauts, making them very expensive and of course restricting them to low Earth orbit and to times when the space shuttle was still flying. But now, after decades of development, it looks like we're going to see satellites that can service other satellites. The best place to do this is geostationary orbit, because all of the spacecraft there are pretty much in the same plane. They're all moving very slowly relative to each other, so spacecraft could potentially reach multiple targets. Also, it takes a lot of energy to put a spacecraft into geostationary orbit, and the spacecraft that are in geostationary orbit frequently talk to stationary ground stations, for example, consumer satellite dishes on the side of buildings, which means the radio hardware on these satellites has a long life ahead of it. Staying in a geostationary orbit also requires continuous uh, manoeuvres to remain in the plane because the moon tends to pull the spacecraft out of plane. So when these satellites are placed into orbit, they have a known lifetime constrained by their ability to make these manoeuvres to stay in orbit. So restoring this manoeuvring capability is a great way to get more life out of your satellite and that's why Intelsat has been very interested in this. So Intelsat 901 was launched in June of 2001 and it provided geostationary sa uh, services over Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. And just last year it was boosted into a graveyard orbit to make way for a new spacecraft which will take its place and that launched on the same Proton rocket that is carrying the Mission Extension Vehicle. The MEV was originally developed as a collaboration between Orbital ATK and US Space called Vivisat. That ended in a lawsuit, but it was taken back under Orbital ATK and now is part of Northrop Grumman, and it's being sold as part of Northrop Grumman's Space Logistics Service. Since launch, it's been making its way up to geostationary orbit and rendezvous using electric propulsion, and when it gets close, it will initially perform a fly around and inspection of the target spacecraft to make sure that everything looks correct. When Intelsat 901 was designed and built, there wasn't any consideration given to servicing on orbit, so its fuel fill lines, for example, are stoppered off and sealed. And perhaps more importantly, there are no features designed as grapple points that other spacecraft could use to you know, hold on to. A basic requirement for any servicing would be the ability to hold on to the other spacecraft so you can do stuff with it. So the mission extension vehicle isn't going to try anything complicated like in-space refueling. Instead, it's just going to attach itself to the other spacecraft and become its propulsion system. And it's going to attach via the existing propulsion system. There is a, an engine which was used to inject the spacecraft into geostationary orbit. So the MEV will maneuver behind the spacecraft and very carefully insert a probe into this and then expand it out so it can grab the spacecraft via the thrust chamber and finally it retract it and pull the two spacecraft together until they are locked into one unit. This process has to be somewhat automated since there is enough communications delay that if something went wrong the spacecraft might have to fix it more quickly than a human would see it. Once the two spacecraft are properly mated, the attitude control and propulsion will be disabled on Intelsat and the MEV will now take over those duties. Intelsat will continue to perform its main communications role, which means it needs its own solar panels to still operate. And the two spacecraft are mated such that the solar panels from one will not occlude the other, so they're rotated like at 90 degrees to each other. Now, assuming this entire operation succeeds, the two spacecraft won't immediately leave the graveyard orbit. They will stay there for something like three months, where the operators will demonstrate that they are able to control the combined spacecraft and 
provide all the services that are required. And only then do they get to return to their position in geostationary orbit to take up their new job. And they can do this for up to an extra five years. In fact, there's actually a couple of extra years built into the extension. But interestingly, Intelsat also have the option of detaching the MEV and moving it to another one of these satellites to extend its lifetime. So if the communications hardware on the new satellite were to fail, it could be moved back into a graveyard orbit and the MEV could resurrect some other spacecraft. And Intelsat already have a second MEV lined up for launch later this year. Again, it'll piggyback on another launch on an Ariane 5. This one is targeted for Intelsat 1002, which curiously is a different manufacturer satellite. The Intelsat 901 was built by Space Systems Laurel, whereas Intelsat 1002 was built by Airbus. And if both of these succeed, it will be a great demonstration of the MEV's capabilities to work with multiple satellites. Having said that, the people that built Intelsat 901, Space Systems Laurel, now known as Maxar, they have been working on their own uh, you know, satellite servicing capability, including in-space refueling. And they've been working with both NASA and DARPA to figure out how to do this. NASA's actually had several experiments on the space station to figure out how to do the refueling. Because as I said, the satellites are not designed to be services. The, va the fueling valves are screwed shut and then they're wired shut and then they're covered by a thermal blanket or two. So to refuel the satellites is a pretty convoluted operation. Which is probably why Intelsat have chosen the much easier piggyback rescue. And in 2022, we hope to see the launch of Restore-L, and its job will be to rendezvous with Landsat 7 and refuel it while it's still in space. Which would be great to get more life out of this spacecraft, but more importantly, it's just a demonstration of this key technology. Maxar were also the prime contractor on DARPA's robotic servicing of geostationary satellites, RSGS project. And that was kind of cool because it had a spacecraft with a pair of robotic arms that would be able to go up and do you know, all sorts of operations to service the spacecraft. And that was actually the subject of lawsuits by other competitors. And then you know, Maxar dropped out early last year. But it, the program still isn't dead and NASA and the DARPA are still sort of working on it. So it may see some life yet. And Maxar have also taken the robotic arm from that and they are remarketing it as the Dragonfly. Their pitch is that if you could assemble a satellite on orbit using that robotic arm, then you could make a larger spacecraft with larger antenna. Currently, of course, if you have to launch a, ro a spacecraft, then it has to fold down inside a fairing and then unfold when it reaches the target. But that does still limit some structures. So the belief is that if you had a robot arm on board, you could build a more capable system. But back at Northrop Grumman, the space logistics team is pitching the next step past the MEV. They're talking about now the mission extension pods, MEPs, and those are carried by the mission robotic vehicle. Now, the concept is pretty much the same, but instead of having an entire spacecraft that services one other, you have the robotic vehicle which carries multiple extension pods, and it will perform the same rendezvous, and then it will attach a single pod to a single spacecraft, and then depart and allow itself to go off and service other spacecraft. This is great because, of course, there's a lot of complicated technology needed for the, the, you need the big solar panels for the electric propulsion, you need the extra sensors and cameras, the robotic manipulators, all that hardware can be placed on the single robotic vehicle and the mission extension pods can be very simple with a single solar panel and the single engine. So this could get a dedicated geosynchronous launch of its own and it could go from one customer to the next in geostationary orbit, giving new life to its satellites. And while this covers most of the possible customers up there, there are a few that could really use something like Dragonfly. In particular, the satellite that launched alongside the MEV was Utilsat West 5B, and when it reached its target in geostationary orbit, it found that it was unable to deploy one of its solar panels. So they're currently trying to figure out what to do with this satellite that doesn't have the power that it thought it would have. Well, if only another spacecraft could go up and help it unfold that solar panel, it might have a bright future ahead of it. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.